Well, it turns out Israel is not beating Hamas, um, and perhaps this is why they're starting a war with with Iran. Maybe they're using this as a as a distraction. But this latest report came out from CNN. This bombshell CNN special report. Netanyahu says victory over Hamas is in sight. The data tells a different story. So what does the data say in this article? Well, essentially, recent analysis indicates that 50% of Hamas's military units in northern and central Gaza have restored some combat capabilities despite Israel's extensive offensive. So they were going around, they were defeating these Hamas battalions, and then they would rebuild. So as much as they would say, we've, we've defeated this one and this one, and we've eliminated this one and we've eliminated that one, the truth is, is after this has been analyzed by experts, it turns out Hamas is actually rebuilt and Israel is not even close to actually defeating them. Hamas has effectively utilized limited resources, reestablishing units in areas previously cleared by Israeli forces. Um, the issue is, is that Hamas is a guerrilla style army and they continue to fight and rebuild. One of the reasons why they've been able to rebuild is because the devastation in Gaza and the the devastation that the people are experiencing there has caused thousands to sign up to fight for Hamas. So they're rebuilding at a rapid rate because they're causing so much destruction and harm to the civilians. So that, you know, that was something that a lot of people warned Israel about. Of this, what you're doing is only going to turn the world against you, and it's only going to turn Palest it's only going to make Palestinians angrier. This is only going to cause more harm than it is good by by going and pummeling all of Gaza, killing all these women and children. And that's exactly what has happened. Um, according to the report, the Israeli military's face challenges in fully clearing areas of Hamas fighters with the group blending in with civilians, concealing weapons and rubble. Uh, they've been able to use their extensive tunnel network in order to um, they're using, they're, they're going undetected in the tunnel network. They're using it to fight quite a bit. Now there's a lot of criticism. I know that the mainstream narrative that's been going is Hamas uses human shields. Hamas uses these tunnel systems. Hamas uses, you know, they're blending in with civilians. We can't tell the difference between them. Those were all tactics, by the way, that were used by the Viet Cong in the Vietnam war. Basically the two are operating almost identically in a lot of ways. And the, the criticism that is being lobbed at Hamas is only used in order to gin up support by Americans to support the onslaught of women and children in Gaza. It's to excuse the killing of women and children. That did not work in Vietnam, and it shouldn't work today. We're starting to see a lot of parallels with Vietnam, in fact, not only the way Hamas fights, the outrage that people have over the women and children being killed in Gaza, Remember the massacres in Vietnam? When Americans found out about that, there was massive outrage. It was great shame on the American military. And um, and the Viet Cong used extremely similar tactics in order to fight and win, which is why obviously Hamas would use similar tactics when they've seen previous victories being done by other guerrilla style militaries. Hamas has enacted that same sort of thing. And yet, it, we're seeing a very similar outcome as well. Same with the Viet Cong being able to rebuild with the massacres like the Miley massacre and the women and children being murdered and uh, by Americans. The, the All that did was inflame and a lot of people joined, the, they switched sides when they saw how the Americans were behaving in Vietnam, how the Americans were fighting in Vietnam. And we're seeing that happen now with Hamas as well. Those people who were not wanting to fight for Hamas, they were not wanting to be militants, in Palestine, they're now fighting with Hamas because they're seeing the atrocities that Israel's committing. So it's just creating a backlash. It's creating, for one, it's not working. The end, the the war is not anywhere near ending, according to this report. So it's uh, the question is then, what does Israel do about this? So if you're Israel and you've been telling the world you're about to beat, you're going to go in, that all of this is what you must do in order to beat Hamas. You've been killing all these women and children. You're saying, well, that's because they're hiding in tunnels. They're using civilians. They're using human shields. And you're still not able to win. Your only options, you only have a couple of options in this scenario, right? If you're Israel, your only option is you could go full-blown genocide. I guess you could go down that path. But the world's watching now. Unlike Vietnam, we have the internet today. So it's worse. People are outraged. We're seeing a lot of protests, especially at the universities, very similar to, to Vietnam. 
a very, very similar parallel is happening here. The difference is we had American soldiers on the ground in Vietnam. This time these are Israeli soldiers, but they're very much backed by Americans. And many of them are actually Americans. These are American Israeli dual citizens that are fighting and killing kids in Gaza. And Americans don't like to see this. So you're seeing a really similar, a really similar uh, trajectory going on here. And it's happening in real time on the internet. So what does Israel do? Well, their only option is they could just kill everybody, but again, everybody's watching. So that would be one way to defeat Hamas is to just say, well, if they're rebuilding, then we just have to eliminate everybody they could rebuild with. So that what would you do? You would, I guess, kill all the men, all the boys. Um, that would be one way to try to win this war. It'd be a gruesome way and you wouldn't win. Ultimately, the world would never trust you. It, it would be terrible for Israel. The second way is you could distract from the fact that you're losing and you could try to wage a wider war so that people don't pay attention to the little war that you've waged on a little strip of land on a group of people that you've completely blockaded and are under your control. And that looks to be the route Israel's going right now, is that they don't really know what to do about Gaza. They're not beating Hamas, so now they're instead looking like they are launching a wider war with those around. And how do we, what, what makes us think that? Well, they've been, they've been on an assassination spree, knowing that that assassination spree is going to result in retaliation. So they've killed Hamas leaders. I'm sorry, not Hamas leaders. They've killed Hezbollah leaders. They've killed Iranian leaders. They've killed, um, so, you know, they're killing in Syria, in, in Iran, in Hezbollah. They're going after all of this leadership in order to, in particular, wage a wider war with Iran and Lebanon, essentially. And that's what it looks like they're doing. It looks like they're they're going down that path, provoking, taunting, poking the bear in order to get us in order to get themselves at least into a wider war, knowing it's going to drag us into it, and also to distract from the fact that they have just completely and utterly lost in Gaza. Hamas is rebuilding, and people warned them of that. There were many people that said, "Look, Hamas will rebuild. You have to have a plan. How are you going to replace Hamas? You can't just pummel the place, kill all the women and children." and have no plan. And Israel wouldn't listen. And now they're in the predicament that they're in. And now because of that, because they wouldn't listen, they're now dragging us, the United States, into a larger war because you know the United States would be there to back them if they go to a war with Iran and with Hezbollah. So now Israel is saying, now that Iran is has waved the, has raised the red flag of revenge, they're saying that they're going to strike at any minute. We're keeping our eyes open. It could literally happen any minute, even while we're on the show right now. Iran says uh, they're going to strike, and Israel says, well, how about we just strike them rather than waiting? Uh, how this makes any sense is beyond me, but Israel is saying they might do what's called a preemptive strike. Uh, if they think that Iran is going to hit them, they're going to hit Iran first, and they're saying, well, we have legitimate reason to want to do this because um, if we, if this would deter, they think that this would actually deter Iran. Now they're all, already the ones who did a, a supposed preemptive strike when they killed a bunch of Iranians in the Syrian embassy, when they killed the, one of the leaders of Hamas inside of Te Tehran. They've already done these sort of preemptive strikes. They were already antagonizing. It's Iran who needs to respond to this and Israel saying, we're going to preemptively launch some, some missiles at you. So Israel is saying, according to this, report from Times of Israel that they would consider launching a preemptive strike to deter Iran if it uncovered outright airtight evidence that Tehran was preparing to mount an attack. So outright evidence. Um, they then say they, they have that evidence, and so they're thinking that they're going to go ahead and do a strike, and they want to be first to hit. I, I'm not really sure exactly what they think they're going to do with this, except they will, of course, still there, except that it would absolutely provoke a war. There's a real possibility that Iran does very little, that whatever the retaliation is as they raise the red flag of revenge is that it's just going to be for show or it's just going to be proportionate. And if it is proportionate, then the world will do what they've always done. The United States will do what they've always done with Israel, which is talk them out of escalating beyond that. So usually what happens is Israel does something. You, you could even go back further. You could say Iran did something, then Israel did something, then Iran did something. It doesn't really matter. Whatever it is that Iran does, whatever Israel does to Iran, Iran tends to respond in a very measured way that doesn't escalate into war. Everybody's always worried when Israel does something to Iran and Iran's going to retaliate, 
that it's going to lead to a wider war. But every single time, what has Iran done? They've done more of a show retaliation. Um, it's more of a, uh, okay, we, we got you. That's it. Now, arms down, move on, stop messing with us. That has been, that's been how it's gone forever since the two of them have been at each other's throats. This time, though, it looks like Israel's desperate because of what's going on in, in Gaza. They're not winning that war. They need a war now with Iran and Hezbollah. So now they're talking about preemptively striking Iran. I have no doubt they're going to do it if Iran doesn't retaliate in a way that they want in order to provoke Iran to hit them harder than what Iran maybe was planning on doing. So I have no doubt that Israel would actually get word of what Iran was even planning, kind of think, well, that's not good enough. We actually need a war. And so, and now is our time. We've been trying to go to war with Iran. We've been trying to drag the United States into war with Iran for a long time. And so now is our opportunity. Let's strike them first to provoke them even more, to make them, to force them into striking us harder. We can actually start waging a war. And this wouldn't be the first time that Israel has done this. They have done this in 1956 during the Suez crisis. They um, they did, they preemptively struck is Egypt. They also did that again in the 1967 during the Six Day War, they preemptively struck. And of course, in history, what do they say now? They say, they attacked us. We didn't attack them. They attacked us. And then you look back in the history books and you read it, you say, well, actually, you you attacked them first. They, oh, no, that was preemptive. So it didn't count. They were going to strike us. We defended ourselves with a preemptive strike. We defended ourselves by hitting them first. That was a defense move. That's how they've gaslit us into thinking. So they're saying the same thing that they would now, that they would preemptively defend themselves by striking Iran first, provoking a war that leads the United States into it, and it's somehow self-defense. That's what they're leading us to believe. So keep your eyes out for that because that is exactly where they're headed with this. I do believe that they want a wider war. They've been provoking uh, in a way that they haven't provoked in the past. And it's because they're looking to distract from what's going on in Gaza and in Hamas, uh, what's going on in Gaza. Are we having another technical problem? Oh, no, okay. I froze, I thought, for a second there. Uh, so that is, so, you know, th they've done it in the past and it's worked for them. They get to claim the victim. They'll probably do it again. That is what we're looking at. They're now also hiding. There's apparently a bunker that they've built. The Israelis have a bunker under Jerusalem. This is Shin Bet has prepared this bunker. And now this is under Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is a heavily populated city. Here's Israel always complaining that Hamas is using human shields by building tunnels and bunkers underneath populated areas. What is Jerusalem? Is Jerusalem a desolate wasteland? No, it's an incredibly populated ancient city. Not only that, uh, it has ancient historical sites that we would really not want to see blown up. Christians would not want to see those sites blown up. Jews would not want to see those sites blown up. And Muslims would not want to see those sites blown up. Basically, none of the Abrahamic religions want to see those sites blown up, nor do we want to see people blown up but Israel has built themselves a bunker under Jerusalem. Are they wanting Jerusalem to get to, to be hit? Is that what they're looking for, knowing that that would inflame all of the Abrahamic religions around the world? Is that what they're aiming for? Are they looking, I mean, when the, if they're gonna use this and blame Hamas and say, well, they're using human shields and building bunkers under schools and hospitals, it's not our fault that we had to blow it up. Don't blame us. Are they using that same logic by building a bunker under Jerusalem where there's millions of people and historical ancient sites? Is that is that the thinking? Let's talk about how the countries are reacting to this latest escalation, this latest potential that Iran might strike Israel, that Israel might strike Iran first in a preemptive defensive strike. Let's start off with Russia. So Russia would be the biggest backer of Iran, much like the United States is a huge backer of Israel. Russia's secretary of the Security Council met with Iran Armed Forces Chief of Staff. Uh, so he's there in Iran meeting with them. And this is the secretary of the Security Council. This is Sh uh, Sergei Shoigu from Russia saying that, uh, basically promising Iran that they've got their back. Um, they're saying that they, that they, um, However, you know, that they're allied with with Iran and and that they have their back. So this is interesting. The United States is backing Israel. Russia would be backing Iran. 
Would the United States put boots on the ground? I'm not 100% certain about that. I don't think Russia would put boots on the ground in Iran. I don't think they need to. I think there's plenty of Iranians. But I think that Russia would certainly supply them with air defense, with uh, ammunition, with weapons, with potentially nuclear weapons if Iran needed them, as the United States would be providing that same sort of thing to Israel. So it would be another proxy war. Not only would Israel and Iran be going at it for real against each other, but then there would be a proxy war happening with the United States and Russia. Um, Egypt has said that they don't, they're, so the rest of the Middle East, when people are saying, is this going to turn into a regional Middle Eastern war? It doesn't look like it. It looks like it will remain a proxy war, a real war between Israel and Iran and a proxy war between the United States and Russia. Egypt is saying that they are not going to be allowing any sort of, uh, they're not going to be helping repel any Iranian attack against Israel. They're going to stay out of it is what Egypt is saying. Jordan is also saying they're going to stay out of it. They're saying uh, ni neither country is going to be allowed to use their airspace. So if anybody tries to fly missiles over Jordan, Jordan's going to shoot them down. They don't care where they're coming from. They don't care if they're Israeli missiles. They don't care if they're Iranian missiles. They're going to shoot anything down that flies over their airspace. They just don't want to be involved except to defend their own country. And they don't want anybody using their airspace, and they're, they're firm on that. Saudi Arabia has said that... Um, this is according to the J Post, jpost.com, that uh, Riyadh has declared it will not allow Iranian missiles or drones to pass through its airspace en route to Israel. They also said, quote, Riyadh will not allow any foreign object to pass through. So it looks like they're kind of taking a similar stance to Jordan, which is they have to kind of frame it a little softer. They do get a lot of weapons from the United States. The United States is helping them in their fight against the Houthis in Yemen. So Saudi Arabia has to kind of couch their statements a little bit, but it looks like they're saying no one can use our airspace either. We don't want to, although there are Americans in Saudi Arabia, so I don't know exactly how they're going to, how they're going to maneuver around that one, but they're trying to say, we don't want you to use us. Uh, but America kind of has Saudi Arabia by the balls a little bit, but they, you know, they kind of have, I mean, excuse my language, but they kind of do. I mean, they're, Saudi Arabia, we've, the Gulf Wars were very much to help Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has been, um, is a recipient, uh, they're a purchaser of a lot of American weapons. They need those weapons. We, we also need Saudi Arabia, but I think they, at this point, need us a little bit more than we need them slightly, although that's all shifting, that's all changing. Everything's kind of neutralizing and everybody's kind of moving on and going their separate ways. But as of right now, I don't see Saudi Arabia um, helping Iran, that's for sure. And I, I don't see them helping Israel, but I see them almost begrudgingly having to help in a way because the United States sorts of demands it from Saudi Arabia. So that's kind of, now Iraq uh, is stuck in the middle and Iraq is really truly right in between the two countries and they're gonna see the blunt, they're, they're gonna see the brunt of it. In fact, they already are. There already was an attack by proxy forces um, Iranian backed groups apparently is what they're claiming hit US air bases. There were some US military members who were injured in that attack uh, in Iraq. So Iraq is going to see the, the brunt of it. We're going to see that war again happening there. And which Israel would love nothing, nothing more than to probably take Iraq. I think that's part of the greater Israel. If you look at the map, they might want to be in on taking that. So it, you know, it's an um, interesting time keeping, we're going to have to just as of right now, there's been no attack, right? We're getting close to the end of the show. There's been no attack at this point. And let's hope that Iran Iran uh, has a measured response like they usually do. And let's hope that Israel doesn't do a preemptive attack. But I don't, not holding my breath on that one. I think they want war and I think they want to drag us into it. And I think it's to distract and I think it's to achieve goals that they've always wanted, which is to go to war with Iran. And many Americans have been wanting to go to war with Iran. They've been itching for it for a long time, and this is their opportunity. Hey, guys, this was just a clip of a longer show. Catch the full show by going to KimIversonShow.com. It is free. It airs Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. You could go back now and watch this full interview. I highly recommend it. Again, go to KimIversonShow.com. Thank you so much for watching.